morning, everybody. Morning. Got a real nice turnout this morning. Uh, we need to start our meeting as we usually do with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome you all here. We have a, a very nice presentation this morning. Uh, Miss Carol Phillips is going to give us a presentation on the history of American fly fishing. She has quite a nice display up here and we'll go through all of it, I'm sure. Try not to get her sidetracked. <laughs> so Carol, would you like to come on up? so much for for coming out the last time I did this program was for the Dallas Texas fly fishers it was 108 degrees outside we were in a small metal building and the air conditioning had been out all day so I appreciate the contrast we're experiencing today in Bella Vista <laughs> the history of American fly fishing is full of innovations from Americans the best way to tell the story, I have found, is through equipment, rather than me just getting sidetracked and babbling endlessly. Not that I've been known to do that. So we're going to start at the very beginning, as far as we know what the beginning is, and that is 2,000 years ago, at least. Fly fishing isn't new. 2,000 years ago, Countries that we now call Egypt, Jordan, China, Japan, and even North America had traditions of fly fishing, even back then. Even, at, <laughs> even in that period of time, there was fly fishing going on. We know this because there's documentation. In China, there are woodcuts of fly fishing activity. In Japan, there are paintings of fly fishing activity. And last year, I was fortunate enough to go to Egypt and go to Beni Hassan, which is a tomb just off the Nile River. And there is a painting in the tomb of fly fishing. It's 2,000 years old. And next, after that, I went to Mount Nebo not in Arkansas, <laughs> in Jordan, where there is a floor mosaic that is dated to about 300, 200 A.D., of fly fishing. When I walked in the museum, I asked the curator, I want to see the fly fishing mosaic, and he just laughed and took me right to it. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not the only one who's uh, gone to Jordan to look at a mosaic of fly fishing people. <laughs> So we know that fly fishing is in Mesopotamia, it's in China, it's in Japan, it's even in North America, because Native Americans have that tradition as well. By the Middle Ages, fly fishing has extended into Europe and into England. The techniques are the same, we believe, because of documentation throughout the world at this period of time. And it is a technique of getting a, a branch, <coughs> a green branch from a tree that has a taper to it. You tie a knot or a loop on the end of that branch and you get white, preferably white, horsehair from the tail of a horse and braid it into a fly line. And at the very end for tippet and leader, maybe one strand of horsehair. It all tapers down just as it does today. The concept of a fly rod being tapered, the fly line being tapered to put the casting energy to the fly, they knew that even then. And they used deer hair, or stag hair as they would call it in Europe. They used feathers. They used dyed wool. 
they made hooks. Some areas were still uh, able to use um, things like copper to make the hook out of. But they also used bones from animals shaped into a, fly, into a hook size and shape. They would use turtle shells for the same thing. And if they couldn't have something to make an actual hook, they would use what's called a gorge. And that would be a pointed type of stick that we know when fish take a fly, they tend to take it and then they'll turn. Well, it's that turn that would get the fish lodged, the, um, the gorge lodged in the fish's throat. And if it didn't pull out, you could catch your fish. Interesting. By 1450, fly fishing is very popular in England, in Great Britain, in Scotland, Ireland. And an, an English woman, Juliana Berners, who is a Catholic nun from St. Albans, writes the first fly fishing book. And she discusses fly rods, fly lines, all of the things that we are familiar with today. Her book isn't published until after her death, and it's published in a very limited supply. Uh, word is that the publisher was afraid fly fishing would become too popular and people would start messing with his favorite stretch of stream. We don't know, but could be. Uh, but it's popular not only for recreation, but also for food. And the Catholic Church helped fly fishing immensely as well. They tended to have at least 140 holy days throughout the year. And during these holy days, only fish and fruit could be eaten. So everybody went to go catch fish. It's fabulous. When Europeans come to America, whether they were English soldiers, French trappers, settlers, they brought with them fly fishing equipment. There were fly fishing makers or fly tackle makers in Great Britain by the time settlers started coming here. Still this kind of rudimentary type, still some horsehair fly lines, still simple flies, but you had people who were had cottage industries who would provide equipment to people, so they brought it with them. And if you didn't have it, you made it when you got here because you were familiar with it. In 18, uh, 16, 1685, William Penn of Pennsylvania, his daughter is with him in Pennsylvania and she writes to her brother in London and she says, I've just wasted all summer fly fishing. Please send more rods, more lines, and some flies. Wasted. <laughs> Wasted. <laughs> I hope she was being funny. I think she was. In the early to mid-1700s, American fly fishing equipment was still by and large being imported from England if you had money. They were sold in stores. There was advertising in newspapers to come to my store and get your fly fishing things here. I've just got a new shipment from England. Come buy my stuff, and people would. But if you didn't have means, you still knew how to make fly fishing equipment. By the American Revolution, there are numerous fly fishing clubs in America, in Boston, in Philadelphia, in New York. And people are already starting to complain about there's too many people on the river and there's too many people in the lake and there's too many people at my pond fly fishing. They also sought to regulate public waters at that time. This is the early 1700s, but commercial fishermen were out on lakes, rivers, streams, and ponds, and commercially fishing and taking all the fish. So there was an effort to do that and uh, privatize some waters that couldn't be open to commercial fishing. When Lewis and Clark go on their great adventure, they take fly fishing equipment with them. In 1803, 
they go to Philadelphia and they buy fly fishing gear and the receipt for that purchase still exists and is in the Philadelphia Museum of Natural History to this day, in case you want to go to Philadelphia. <laughs> On their trip, they describe all sorts of fish that they caught, but the most unusual one, because it's only located west of the Mississippi, was cutthroat trout. And that may figure into our story a little later on. After the War of 1812, we're still having the same, I cut, a, I cut a tree limb and I'm gonna go fly fishing. But things are getting ready to change. <coughs> fly fishing <coughs> magazines, sporting magazines are publishing articles about fly fishing. There's more advertising. And because during the American Revolution, we didn't import fly fishing gear from England. There's a whole small industry of men and women who are making fly rods, braiding horsehair, and making flies. There's over a thousand species of cane or bamboo. Kind of the same thing. We call it bamboo, they call it cane in Great Britain. Calcutta cane from India was the standard that was used at that point in time. And an American, Samuel Philippe, decided that he would split some, some uh, Calcutta cane and see what happened. And this is what happened. Fly rod links depended upon really where you were fishing the type of water. We know horsehair flies, uh, horsehair fly lines, but the style was dappling or nymphing or high sticking or whatever we call it today. I'm not going to put this together because I'll, I might hurt something up there. <laughs> not the rod; it's lasted a long, long time. But rather, you know, just following along like we do today, just and a very short cast. So this rod, though, is typical of a 1700s rod. This is Calcutta cane. It is not split. It is the solid piece of Calcutta cane. But what Samuel Philippe did was decide to split some cane and make a more flexible tip that would react to casting better. Mm -hmm. You could cast, people would cast a little bit of fly line, but not very much. The fly line length tended to be not much longer than the rod. But because of his innovation of making a flexible split tip, it allowed for dry fly fishing and the concept of doing that to come to the forefront. People already knew deer hair was hollow and it would float. They just didn't have the means to keep it dry and feathers would absorb. The technology came about later to make fly, uh, dry fly fishing much more suitable, but this is merely lashed to the tip of this Calcutta cane, making it fairly flexible. You would essentially tie it on there for the season and then untie it or cut it away and put it away so the tip wouldn't be broken. The fittings are brass. This is probably hickory for the handle, two-handed, because these things getting long were still pretty heavy. So you wanted to hold it with two hands. The guides are added later on, but there was a concept of making wire guides where you would just make a piece of wire and then twist it and make it into a guide. So it was still all hand done. With longer fly lines and Mr. Philippe's concept of splitting cane for a rod tip come reels. Now reels had been around for a long time, but not really used didn't need them. You were only casting or using enough fly line of the length of the rod. But with this idea of more fly line and a flexible tip, reels came into being. And this is a wooden reel. And these were actually made for a long, long time. There's no drag. There's nothing on it. It's a spool with a handle. And that's about all there is to it. But it functioned and it worked well enough.
during the um, Civil War, not a whole lot of innovation went on with fly fishing in America. But after the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution, as we all know, people moved from farms and from the woods into the city and got jobs there. And it, whether you were a robber baron or you weren't, you still wanted to have recreation time. And fly fishing was a very popular recreation time activity. This is when American rod makers and reel makers truly come to the, begin to come to the forefront. There are a number of rod makers who begin to experiment. And one of the things that they discovered <laughs> was, by gosh, Tonkin cane is better than Calcutta cane. We don't have to use that. Let's try this. And taking Mr. Philippe's idea of, of a six split cane piece whether it's Calcutta or Tonkin, but Tonkin was better. It had less bug gnaws on it. It had uh, fewer nodes on it. It held up better. So after the Civil War, making a rod of Tonkin King became really the standard, and a lot of builders were out there. This is um, an H.L. Leonard. Because the glues were so bad, and I suppose you could say they were horse glue, the bamboos uh, pieces didn't stay together very well. And this will show you how the strips are. You know, they're, they're plain, they're cut, they're trimmed, and they all fit together to become one piece. But because the glues were so bad, they began doing intermediate wraps to keep the rod pieces together so they wouldn't come apart. That's why rods of this time frame have so many intermediate wraps because the glue was unstable. This also has an agate guide insert. Silk lines, metal guides, don't go well together. The guides would tend to, to shred the silk fly lines. And as long as the piece of agate inside didn't break, then it got sharp and it would cut your fly line. Uh, but agate was very popular for rod tips and for, uh, for guides. This is uh, one of the more fancier ones. It has cedar inlay on it, nickel, silver, real seed. And reel makers are coming out with a lot of innovation as well. This is a very simple reel, has rubber side plates. It does have kind of a click mechanism to it. The drag is just a click as well, but it's whole, able to hold more fly line. They're not using backing yet because silk lines don't tend to shift and all as nylon fly lines do today. So there's no backing. But with a rod like this, you could fish a, a lot of different places. And one of the places that was getting more and more popular was fishing in saltwater. And the cork is sheet cork. It is not rings like we do today, but it's just a sheet of cork on the, on the grip. The Columbia Exhibition of 1893 was held in Chicago on the shores of Lake Michigan. There was a fisheries building there, and 27 million people came to the Columbia Exhibition. A lot of people were exposed to fly fishing at that time. They had saltwater tanks with saltwater fish. They had freshwater tanks with freshwater fish. They had casting tanks for fly fishing. Rod builders were there. 
Reel makers were there. Fly tires were there. And as wonderful as all that is, there was one more wonderful thing that happened during the expedition. Mary Orvis Marbury was the daughter of the founder of the Orvis Company. She was in charge of their fly tying department. They did a lot of mail order business, as they still do today. She realized that when people would mail order a fly with a specific name, it may be different from that named fly in their part of the country. Fly fishing is now all over. It's in Texas, it's in Louisiana, it's everywhere. But there's no consistency with fly patterns. She worked on getting a standardized, making a standardizing book of fly patterns so there would be consistency. And my woolly booger would look like your woolly booger and not your royal wolf. She specifically had these done before the exhibition in 1893 so she could hand them out to the fly tires who were there and everybody could be <clears throat> on the same page. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Also, one of the uh, things that were discussed during the Columbia exhibition was conservation. Just prior to around 1883 or so, brown trout were introduced to North America. People loved them. They grew fast. They were hard fighters. And they adapted to just about anywhere you put them. So they were put everywhere. Unfortunately, they were driving out the rainbows and the brook trout that were native to North America. And this is a problem that was even, oh, people were even aware of at that point in time. And although many people wanted them removed, many people wanted them to stay. So they stayed for a while. <laughs> well, one thing they had done was they had destroyed um, the fishery of cutthroat trout. And cutthroat trout were just declared extinct in 1937. To make you feel better, I will tell you that wasn't really true because in 1969, a remote group of them were found hiding in a relocation, I can't tell you. <laughs> and so they were essentially reintroduced. But for many years, think of it from 1937 to 1969, we had essentially lost cutthroat trout in most of our streams <clears throat> until they were rediscovered or restocked. But in the 1930s, we have Outdoor Life magazine, and we have Field and Stream, and everybody is into fly fishing, and Lee Wolf writes a handbook, and it sells phenomenally. It's really one of the, the, the first instructional book, basic, in a long, long time, that had been published. So he's writing. His wife Joan is uh, teaching fly fishing uh, and teaching people how to cast. But American fly fishing entrepreneurs are again making rods. But there's so many people that want rods that well, they're kind of cutting some corners and some are just gosh darn awful. Um, <laughs> Some places, like Montague, very common, they had good rods, but they also made some terrible ones. You could pay $2 and get a fly rod, which would probably more, be more appropriate for staking up tomatoes. <laughs> or you could spend $40 and get a top-of-the-line Montague fly rod. And people have asked me many times over the years, there's a Montague fly rod on eBay, should I get it? Well, you need to find out what type it is. Is it one that's good? Is it one that has aluminum ferrules that are going to fall apart? Or is it one that has nickel silver and, and good? So you should do the same thing if you ever want to look at getting a Montague 
thyroid. <clears throat> the other things that were mass produced in the 1930s, some good, some bad, were fly reels. They were really cheap fly reels, and they were good fly reels. These skeleton reels had been around for a long time, since the 1870s or so, and they're still being made by World War II. Nothing wrong with them. They hold enough fly line. They have a drag to them. They're all right. This is Bakelite. Who thought of that? You drop this, it's going to crack or it's going to break. I don't know why this one's still intact. I have no idea. Um, Fluger. Fluger came out with their metalist reel, which is still kind of a standby today. Unfortunately, it's not made in the U.S. anymore. But if you can find one made in the U.S., it's still a good reel. Somebody came up with this to go in some goofy way on your rod. Um, I'm not really, it doesn't even have a drag. But it looks neat. <laughs> This is a Mickelbach, which is considered a better, one of the better um, American-made reels of that time period. It has a nice, sweet little click to it. I neglected to talk about ferrules, but I'm going to do that really, really soon. And another thing that is still good, that was good then too, are Hardy fly reels from England. Anybody ever heard of Hardy? Yep. House of Hardy? It was not uncommon at all, just like it is today, to get an American-made outstanding fire rod, but put an English reel on it. This is uh, an old uh, Hardy Cascopedia. They still make these today. They've been making these over 100 years. But you still get parts for these, too. This is <clears throat> my first fly reel. <clears throat> that my grandfather gave me, <clears throat> and he used it for many years before he gave it to me. <clears throat> You're not even going off on a tangent. I still can't talk. <clears throat> so hardy fly reels and a good American-made fly rod was just the epitome of fly fishing perfection in the 30s. World War II comes. Fly fishing, well, Ginger Rogers fly fished, and she's on the cover of Life magazine in 1944. This is what you're fighting for. <laughs> Women folk are going to take over and fly fish everywhere. <laughs> but I just think that's a really neat picture. And the fact that she was an avid fly fisher person is outstanding. The next innovation, there are really two that happened immediately after World War II. One are fly lines. After horsehair, for all those years, we used silk fly lines. A lot of labor required just to use them. They had to be soaked before you used it. They had to be dried after you used it. They had to be treated with linseed or shellac or any number of concoctions that people would come up with to make your fly line last longer. But after the war, with the invention of nylon, we have fly lines that we would recognize today as being a fly line. Even with silk fly lines, 
you could make them float. Because when they would, when you would treat it, it would initially float for quite some time. And if you wanted it to sink, when they wove the silk, they would put pieces of copper in there, or some type of metal, and weave in a thread of that to make it sink. So now we have what we could identify kind of as a, a modern fly line. Nylon coated, whatever concoction it may be on the inside. Sometimes they, if you had a lot of silk left over and you were making fly lines, you were going to use this silk as your core. It's the efficient thing to do. By 1946, people were looking for other materials to make fly rods. And fiberglass had been invented in the 1930s, and it was used during the war to make antennas, radio antennas. In 1946, Dr. Howland made a fly rod out of it by making it into sheets of material using a metal mandrel, like we still use today with graphite, he made the first fly rod. And <clears throat> different manufacturers quickly followed suit in making these. Many of them had colors that resembled cane rods. Looks like cane from afar. You had to, you know, change is hard for some people, so you had to do it gently. But there were some that are pink, purple, and orange, and all sorts of things to make them stand out on the shelves. Uh, just horrible looking things. <laughs> for, for me, I never liked fiberglass. I thought it was too stiff, um, too unwieldy, but that's just me. Some people are great fans of them to this day. But one thing it did do is one thing it did is increase the popularity of saltwater fishing. Although people were using bamboo to saltwater fly fish with, a lot of work had to be done to keep the guides clean, to keep the saltwater, to let it make sure it dried properly. If not, it would turn into just too mush. With fiberglass rods, fly fishing and saltwater became more and more and more popular. And because nylon fly lines are so slick, they would move around and bind on the reel. So backing came into being. The same thing that's used for some fly lines as the core would now be used to fill a, a reel to go saltwater fly fishing. This is a fairly early stainless saltwater fly reel. It's incredibly heavy. But it holds backing. And this is about an eight weight rod. And you could catch some fish with this in salt water and not have to worry too much about the fly rod. Okay. There was one problem with all of these fly rods. Bamboo rods are still being made. Fiberglass is really popular. What fly line does that take? There's no standardization for fly lines at that time. The designation on something like this is HDF. Well, what does that mean? That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, fly lines, the size was determined by using a micrometer. The size of the fly line. Literally, the size. So H was the tip. It's fairly thin. D, it's gotten thicker. And F is the running line part of the file line. 
But knowing those three numbers and trying to match a phi line to a rod was really difficult. So, phi line manufacturers got together and said, let's make it simple. Let's do it actually by weight, not by size. And that's the system we use today. The first 30 feet of weight is what the phi line is to match the rod. If it's a five weight rod, put a five weight phi line on it. Or an eight weight, you put an eight weight line on it. There's <coughs> not much difficulty in understanding all of that now, but it was really difficult back then to determine what you wanted. And I don't need to tell you that double taper lines are always a bad idea, do I? Hmm. No. Okay, good. I tend to tangent, so I'm trying I promised I wouldn't, so I'm trying to stay on track with my, my notes here. Graphite. 1974. Now Hardy, the same real people, had made a combination fiberglass graphite rod. They thought, let's add a little fiberglass to that, a little graphite to that, and we'll see what happens. So they added graphite. And they liked it. And customers liked it. It was really a prototype, but they handed some out. And they said, let's patent it, and it'll be all ours. And they did, but they only patented it for a fiberglass rod with 29% graphite. It did take long for people to go, let's make it all graphite, which they did. And Hardy lost out on that. But uh, graphite fi fiber rods come into being in 1974. And here in the past, we've made fi fi uh, flies out of really pretty much natural materials. And all of a sudden, now, we have graphite fly rods, we have fabulous fly lines, and we're making flies out of materials we hadn't heard of a few years ago. Mylar wings, you know, all these things. It was, just, it, it was just a wonderful time for the evolution of fly fishing. And Americans led the way, and we still lead the way in innovation in fly fishing. Many fly rods, uh, bamboo and graphite are still made in the U.S., or they're made by U.S. companies. Many are made in China and Korea, but you're still supporting a U.S. company if you get your rods from there. And many uh, reels are still made in the U.S. Ross, um, <coughs> Lamson makes most of theirs here, too. So you have the opportunity to you know, get a piece of history. I've got my first rod in 20-something years a few weeks ago <laughs> because uh, my son shamed me into it. And the neat thing is it's a five weight and whereas a five weight used to be the size of my little finger toward the, the grip, it's now a five weight, it's half the size of my little finger. It's just amazing that technology is still evolving it's becoming lighter and hopefully more user-friendly than ever before. I'm almost done. I have one challenge thing for you. I know many of you... I know many of you tie flies, and some of you may even fly fish. One of the, the fun things about tying flies for me has been to do innovation and then do traditional and do a lot of different things. And I don't tie as much as I used to because I have such a backlog of flies, I need to use some before I can tie any more. But if you do tie, I challenge you to come up with the best, the goofiest stuff you can do and put them in a display case and annoy your children and grandchildren with what they're going to do with it when you're gone. <laughs> yes. Already have. <laughs> nice.
there are some weird things on there. One is a, a, a Q-tip fly. You know, dragonfly with a Q-tip is... Over there. That's about all I can think of. And I haven't gone off on a wild tangent or anything. I'm so proud. You don't have a boot fly on there. Pardon? You don't have any boot flies on there. Uh, no. Those came after I did. That's from 1990 or so. <laughs> um, I don't have a crystal ball for the future of fly fishing. But all I do know is as long as there's a lake or a river or a stream or an ocean, I'm going to be out there fly fishing. Mm -hmm. And I hope y'all will too. Thank you very much.